Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and today I'm going to be taking you through Ascaris, the roundworm helminth that infects one sixth of all humans on the planet. And I'm going to be talking about how they cause disease. And I think you'll be surprised by some of the answers here. So, first of all, it's a nematode and it's a roundworm. Now, a little fact about ne nematode it's a branch of animalia and so animals it's animals and it's a round worm but it's not like earthworms they're called segmented worms and it's not like tapeworm which is a flat worm it's a very unique species called a, a unique clade called roundworms well these roundworm nematodes make up four fifths of all animals on the planet which is crazy. There are something like 50 billion nematodes for every human on the planet. Their species are crazy. It's no surprise some of them evolved to infect us. Most of them are just soil, um, in the soil or in the water, but some of them do infect us. Um, and those are called Ascaris infections or helminths, which means infective worm, a parasitic worm. So 85% of these cases are asymptomatic. Uh, they don't cause any symptoms at all. And we're going to cover why this actually puts them in the iffy category when it comes to obligate parasite. Yes, they're an obligate organism, but are they an obligate pathogen parasite? Um, and the symptoms are really dose dependent. If you have one or two, the symptoms are going to be incredibly low, but they do get up to hundreds of worms in a single individual, particularly children who are very vulnerable. This causes problems and this causes disease. And you can probably think of some very obvious problems that occur when you have hundreds, handfuls of 15 centimeter long worms in your intestine. But how does it cause disease? Well, let's jump into it. First of all, there's the obvious thing. Handfuls of worms in your intestine can cause blockages, and sometimes this requires surgical removal. This is incredibly rare, but it does occur. If you have a nest of worms in your intestine, it can cause blockages, and that can lead to malnutrition. It can lead to damage of the intestinal wall. It can even lead to leaking of the intestinal wall. Bacteria come out, sepsis. It can cause a whole bunch of problems. Um, so here we see uh, them removing Ascaris roundworms from the intestine of a person here. I'm sorry you had to see that image, but it's a, it's a medical channel. You're going to see this kind of stuff. Trust me. Okay, so that's obviously rare. Now you're probably thinking the main problem with worms, we probably have this intuition and we've probably even made jokes about it. When you have a skinny friend that eats lots and lots, you kind of go, you've probably got worms because you're eating so much and yet you don't gain weight. You've probably got worms who are stealing all your nutrients. And that's kind of the intuition about how worms cause pathology. Um, our new home offers wondrous unlimited supply of delicious food. Now this giant thing that as we eat the hamburger, they're eating the hamburger and they're stealing our nutrients. But this is wrong. This is wrong. Um, and for, for the vast, vast majority, this is wrong. So um, Ascaris, um, uh, as the largest Ascaris weighs 3.2 grams per worm. Um, and they can go up to about 15 centimeters. Um, now, the calculations on this have been very difficult to calculate because they have a unique anaerobic metabolism um, designed for being in the intestine. But it's estimated to consume about, a, the, a large Ascaris, about 6.7 kilojoules of energy per day. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means each large Ascaris worm eats about a tenth of a potato chip. Now, most worm burdens are in the single digits, some are in the early double digits, very few get over 100. And so you're talking about a one or two or three potato chips um, as a nutrient source. Now, unfortunately, there are people that are on the edge. They are malnourished. Um, uh, and that, uh, currently Madagascar is going through a massive famine right now and that has a high worm burden. Now this could be the straw that breaks the camel's back so I don't want to downplay it but it's not the major thing that's going on and that's probably your intuition is that the worms are stealing your food. It's not the major thing that's causing the disease. So do helminths cause slow weight gain in children do they cause any weight gain problems and the answer is yes right so they so in this study they um, recruited children they fed them and they gave some of them a placebo and some of them a deworming agent it was done a wee while ago um, i don't know if that would get through ethics committees today 
Um, so the placebo group, because they're being looked after, they're part of a clinical trial, they did gain weight over three to seven weeks here in the white graphs here. But the, but the children that had the deworming agent gained significantly more weight. And you're probably thinking, but Jack, you just told me that they don't steal many nutrients. They don't steal a lot of calories. So what is causing this difference? So how how is this effect coming in? And the answer is interesting. So the answer is multifaceted, but here is one branch of them. Your appetite is suppressed by worms. And um, by through deworming, we increase the appetite of the, chi of, of the children in this clinical trial. Um, and that's really interesting. So we normally think worms would make you hungrier, but they don't. They make you less hungry. They decrease your appetite. How do they do that? That's an interesting question. Also, there's a multifaceted answer to it. So part of it is hormones. We've shown that the hormones that signal our appetite are changed um, in response to worm infections. Now, there is a little bit of a question here. Is it the worms inducing the change? It doesn't seem like that's logical. They'd want more food. And in fact, there's some evidence that it's part of our immune response to the worms that suppresses, our, um, uh, suppresses the hormones that induce appetite. There is also the physical effect. When you get enough worms in the intestine, you slow the flow of the intestine, and the flow is associated with our appetite. If you have a blockage, um, you, you, you can block, uh, you start to send signals to your brain that you cannot eat anymore because you have a blockage and a full intestine. And that actually ties these two things together. So yes, the immune system might be driving hormonal changes to suppress your appetite, but there is also the physical effects of the worms on your intestine causes hormones to be released to suppress your appetite. One of these responses is stretching. Um, the stretching of the intestinal uh, wall releases hormones to say that I have enough food right now because my intestines are full and stretching. So that mechanical force causes the release of hormones that suppress your appetite. Um, and then there are some things that are, occur outside of appetite. So those two things are strongly related to appetite. There are some things going on outside of it. One is pathology of the gut. So if you get, there is some evidence that if you have a lot of worms in your intestine, you actually start to damage the intestine. Now the intestine has these finger-like processes called villi. Now the point of the villi is to um, increase the surface area. If you imagine there's a lot of surface area like that and not a lot of surface area like that, it takes a lot longer for my finger to trace each individual finger than it does to trace my hand. So it increases the surface area. More surface area is if you absorb nutrients through that surface, you increase your ability to absorb nutrients by having villi in your intestine. Now there's some evidence that a high worm burden can damage, break and reduce the numbers of villi and shrink their size, thus reducing your ability to absorb nutrients. So that can also be happening. And a final thing that can be happening is, remember the worms, they don't want to be digested. So ascaris worms secrete a number of things to block digestive enzymes in the intestine. So they don't get digested. But in the crosshairs, they prevent the digestion of the food that you're eating. So there's multiple faceted things going on that cause a heavy worm burden, pretty much only a heavy worm burden, to um, affect your effective caloric intake how much not how much you're eating but how much you're absorbing how much you want to eat um, so affect the, your food intake and energy intake in general now in the places that worms are prevalent uh, such as sub-saharan africa um, uh, uh, are low-income countries that have um Look, uh, poorly developed sewage systems which allows that soil contamination allows that life cycle to occur and healthcare systems that can't manage it um, uh, they are also there's a high correlation between that and food insecurity so they are often the ones that are both being hit by uh, food insecurity and low calorie intake because of economic factors and socioeconomic factors as well as um uh, as well as having high risk of worm burden. So those two things can magnify as a malnourishment effect, and that's where some of those deaths come from. They can also cause lung damage. Now, remember, they migrate from the blood vessel into your lungs, and as they do that, 
they can cause tissue damage. So here's a nice pretty lung here. I'm going to say the sectioning isn't fantastic, but each of these are a little air sac here. Um, and that is where the air comes in and the gas exchange happens with the blood, right? So these are the little alveoli around here. Um, and this is a uh, airway coming in here. Now here we can see... Um, here we can see some of these little Ascaris worms coming through. And what we can see is they're surrounded by these small blue dots. Now, these small blue dots, if you ever see them on an H&E slide, they are very often immune cells. Um, so these are the infiltrating immune cells in here. So we've got an inflammatory response. And you can see the areoli are inflated. They're, they're collapsed. And so it does cause a little bit of damage. But it's very local. Uh, but on rare events, when you get a massive... Um, a massive dose of eggs all on one occasion, it can cause quite a lot of damage as they all migrate simultaneously through the lungs, right? And that can cause um, uh, some severe issues. Um, and now I'm about to tell you about the worst thing ever, right? So um, one of the things that keeps the scars out of the stomach is the acidic environment of the stomach. But there are a number of things that can get rid of the acidic environment of the stomach, including mass trauma, um, general anesthesia, but also amoprazole, a drug that um, uh, amoprazole, a drug that inhibits acid production in the stomach to help protect your stomach if you have stomach ulcers and things like that. That gets rid of the signal for a scar to not go into your stomach. Now this is rare. This is rare, but there have been occasions where Ascaris hives, nests, uh, tangled webs of Ascaris have climbed up the esophagus and out the mouth and they've even caused choking and death by getting caught up in the airways as they crawled up the stomach during general anesthesia for example. That to me sounds like the worst thing in the world um, and it's really really sad but it's also just so horrific I'm like nervous smiling right now because it's just unfathomably bad it's really night nightmare inducing okay but here i told you i was going to get to this here's the question 85 percent of people with worms are asymptomatic undoubtedly pre-modern hygiene worm burden was even higher than it is today right so right now it's very very high it's huge um it, when you add up all the worms it might be a third or higher of the world have one or more of these different genuses of um, worms and so we evolved with worms so there is this question did we evolve with them as a symbiotic relationship are they not a parasite are they a symbiont are they something that benefits us is there mutual benefit for us and this is the new research that's coming out. This one came out in 2019. Um, it, was, it was quite a stir when it came out. So here is a control lung. Here you can see the alveoli sacs, and they're nice and open. Now, in this, this is an animal model. They've sensitized the animals to dust mites. They've given them a dust mite allergy. So when you administer um, this dust mite, you get thickening of the alveoli wall. You can see those little blue dots are there. Those are immune cells. Um, and you can also see this bright pink stain here. This is a path stain. It's a histological stain. And it stains mucus. So you can see that there's lots of mucus going on. So this is an allergic reaction. The, uh, the, the, these mice will have everything. They'll have a runny nose, wheezing, um, closing of the airways, difficulty breathing. Um, they would have induced a mild version to reduce animal suffering, uh, but this is what will be going on in those animals. Essentially, asthma. It's kind of a model of asthma. Now, Ascaris by itself, um, you know, I mentioned when one or two are popping through the lungs, they do very minimal cell damage. Like, your lungs have, are made up of billions of cells, and you saw it just sort of damaged a local ring of maybe 100 cells. It's not a big deal. Um, so there's nothing going on with an Ascaris infection by itself. Now, Ascaris plus dust mites, it looks normal. It looks healthy. We're not having that inflammatory immune response to the dust mites. Something has changed. Now, to put this into context, allergies are massively on the rise, right? Um, 
if you asked your parents or your grandparents how many of you kids in your class had allergies, they would have said none, maybe one. Now it's up to 10% of children are allergic to peanuts, asthma is going through the roof. So all these allergies are on the rise. And so people are asking that question, is it because we've lowered worm burden? If worms seem to suppress our allergic responses, is lowering our worm burden in the developed world to, to very low levels, is that what's causing the rise of allergens? Now, they've actually done bl double-blind and placebo-controlled trials where they're starting to treat people with hay fever with different kinds of nematodes. Um, they've done two different helmet species. They haven't done Ascaris yet. I'll be interested to see what happens. Um, and what they found was a significant reduction in reliance on the hay fever me uh, medicine. Typically, a reduction around about 33% to 50% reduction in that hay fever medicine. So uh, there is something to this um, and the question is, is can we um, a get the benefits without having worms there's uh, research going into what do the worms secrete that we could just synthesize and take as a pill so we don't have to have worms in our stomach b can we safely have a low level worm burden in our society or will it naturally target the vulnerable people and they'll end up with hundreds of worms and pathology um, very interesting questions though, topsy-turvy, just hitting you with some new research there. How does this happen? I'll just touch on it just a tiny bit. There's evidence that the worms actively lower our immune system so they don't get recognized and killed. And you might think, oh no, you're immune suppressed, are you vulnerable to pathogens? Probably not. It could be that we evolved with them, and so we expect this interaction with the worms. And now that the worms have gone, our immune system might have gone up to a higher, higher level. But this is all just a hypothesis that needs a lot more evidence, but I think it is really exciting research, and I find it absolutely fascinating. Anyway, how do we get rid of these worms? If we've got too many worms, what do we do? Well, we need selective toxicity, but this is going to be really hard. They're an animal, we're an animal, um, how do we target an animal? Um, you know, they've got nerves. In fact, um, in a later video, I'm going to cover using these worms as a model, an animal model of us. And many of the pathways in those worms are in us. So how can we target it selectively? Well, there's something I haven't covered, right? So Ehrlich, 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 the German guy who came up with the magic bullet concept and said we need to chemically target bacteria. Penicillin came along and we could chemically target bacteria, right? So there is another way to target pathogens and it's not chemical. Um, it's not chemically targeting it. It's um, targeting the pathogen where it is. So this is what we call a topical treatment. So a systemic treatment is like a pill or an injection. We take it, it goes around our blood and um, it goes throughout our body and it goes to wherever the pathogen is as well and it will kill the pathogen. Those things have to be selectively toxic because they're going throughout our body. But a topical uh, cream, a topical thing, doesn't have to be selectively toxic. If you think back to carbolic acid, Lister's carbolic acid that he was spraying during the surgeries, um, that was a topical application. It was killing the bacteria where the bacteria were. So they would spray it over the tissue. It would kill some of our cells, but it would also kill the bacteria. That topical application was a great use. If you injected carbolic acid into the patient, they would die because it wasn't selectively toxic. Now, so how do we get rid of these worms? We get rid of these worms with a topical application. It doesn't go into our bloodstreams. It doesn't go into our lungs or our brain or anything like that. It does go into our intestine, but it cannot cross the intestinal wall. So it kills the things within our intestine, but it doesn't kill us. Um, and this is how we get selective toxicity. Um, oh, I'm really bad with drug names. Um, uh, Mibin... Dazole, mebendazole, mebendazole, I'm going to go with. No, mebendazole, mebendazole. So, anyway, mebendazole, gosh, I've got to get better at drug names. Um, anyway, uh, mebendazole uh, cannot cross the intestinal wall, and so it stays in the lumen of the intestine where the ascaris is. And what does it do when it's there? Well, it inhibits uh, microtubules 
building on each other. So it chemically targets those microtubules bu building on each other. Now, microtubules are the cytoskeleton of cells, without which they all form circles and all your macro structures fall to bits, right? We need that cytoskeleton. But it also does other things. It helps transport things around the cells. So essentially, it kills the intestinal lining of the uh, of the worms. And by killing the intestinal lining lining of the worms, you prevent them from eating, and then they die. Now you might say, does it kill our intestinal lining? Well, it is a little bit toxic to us it does prevent our microtubules um, from uh, uh, polymerizing like that um, but uh, our microtubule polymerization is less sensitive to that drug and um, also our intestinal cells are more robust and can be shed whereas the worms are bathed in that drug head to toe getting a much higher concentration um, and they're more vulnerable by being such a small organism they can't survive a few cells dying in their intestine whereas we could shed our intestine and be, uh, intestinal lining and be relatively fine. So but one of the key uh, lessons here is that selective toxicity can be through topical application. Another example is any sort of iodine cream that you use to sterilize um, a, a wound. Um, it's not particularly great to our cells and you would never inject that into a human, but rubbing it topically um, will kill the bacteria on the surface and it's a great sterilizer of the wound. So topical application means that you've got selective toxicity by generating high concentrations at the site of the pathogen and not elsewhere in that body. It's very clever. So up next, we're going to go over scabies, um, and scabies has a topical uh, selective toxicity approach too, um, and it is a skin-eating uh, insect, and it's going to give you the itch.